Okay, welcome back. Uh, so I left you <clears throat> thinking about situations where LT might be good or bad approximation. Uh, so the first one I listed here was the photosphere of the sun. So that's the you know sort of dense atmosphere of the sun um, where we see the optical light uh, coming out. And um, so there, you know, it's it's pretty dense um, and fairly optically thick, uh, you know, until just right at the surface. Uh, and so therefore, um, that is a pretty good, uh, LTE is a pretty good approximation uh, there for, especially, you know, for the, the optical light, well, any radiation really. So it's, as we've said before, stars are pretty good approximations to black bodies, which is another characteristic of LTE. So, so that's a good one. On the contrary, the corona of the sun, the corona is this very hot million degree gas, which sits, you know, way up in the uh, atmosphere of the sun. And that's a extreme sort of uh, non-LTE situation. Um, you know, under thermal excitation, that gas should not be a million degrees, you know, not if it's sitting next to a 6,000 degree surface of the sun. Uh, so that's a very uh, sort of out of equilibrium type of situation. Uh, and that's because of the role of magnetic fields in, in heating that plasma. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely not LTE. It's very low density as well. So not, not optically thick at all. Um, NH2 region, so we've talked about these a few times. Um, so although the continuum radiation there, the free free radio is, is, is okay for LTE. Um, the sort of recombination lines that we were uh, just about to talk about, um, they, it's not a good approximation there um, because you've got, uh, again, it's, it's low density gas um, and the radiation field is coming from the, from the, from the star some way away, you know, very hot star, 3000, sorry, 30,000 degrees or something. Uh, so, you know, quite different uh, from the, the 10,000 degrees gas of the H2 region itself. Uh, the Big Bang, so by the Big Bang here, I mean, you know, basically the, the hot uh, ball of gas at the beginning of the universe that's expanding and cooling down. Um, so for a long time, while it's basically very dense and very hot, um, the Big Bang is actually the, a very good, uh, example of LTE, you've basically got pretty much uniform temperature everywhere, because uh, at that point, the entire universe was ex pretty much exactly the same temperature. Uh, so that almost is the sort of ideal laboratory definition of a, of a black body. It's, it's optically thick because it's so dense, everything's the same temperature. And uh, in a subsequent lecture on the cosmic microwave background, then, you know, you will see that its spectrum is, is actually the best black body spectrum of a like the Planck function that we see anywhere in nature. So that's uh, the best example of LTE. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so I'm just gonna finish up looking at some examples of radio lines in the radio spectrum. And these can arise from ions, atoms, and molecules. So again, we have the full uh, range. So I'm gonna start with um, uh, an example uh, called radio recombination lines. So recombination is this process of a, you know, in its simplest case, you've got an electron and a proton recombining, uh, and this occurs in these photoionized nebulae like the H2 regions that I've uh, talked about previously. Um, so when an electron recombines with a proton, it'll combine usually into one of the high uh, N levels in the hydrogen atom. They're the easiest first ones they encounter. They're the easiest ones to recombine to. And then it will drop down through randomly down through a whole load of, uh, of all these energy levels in the hydrogen atom, you know, until it gets down towards the bottom. So this schematic here sort of shows, you know, uh, a version of the hydrogen energy level diagram and marked on it, you know, basically there's almost an infinite number of energy levels really. Um, so very high up uh, in, uh, in the energy level diagram, the levels get closer and closer together. 
So therefore the difference between them is very small in energy, which means the photon corresponds to uh, a very long wavelength. So it becomes in the radio wave regime, you can see the wavelengths associated with some of these transitions here. So you remember, you know, we have this principal quantum number N that describes the level. So for instance, you know, if an electron dropped from the N equals 110 to the next one down 109, the wavelength of that line would be about six centimeters. Okay, so five gigahertz, so exactly in the sort of one of the main uh, radio astronomy bands. Okay, so there's a whole sequence of these, there's loads of them up there um, uh, in the radio regime. Okay. So we can, uh, here we can see an example. So here's uh, the line that generated by uh, going from 55 down to 54 uh, in, in hydrogen uh, from a particular H2 region. So you can see a nice strong line here. Um, you know, got a whole Jansky uh, of flux at the peak of the line here. Again, looking fairly Gaussian, okay. Um, the same process will occur in ionized helium, okay. So helium can recombine. Uh, it's exactly the same process. Um, in fact, there's only a small shift just because of the difference in charge on the nucleus. Uh, and so you, you get both of these lines often together. Uh, so you can see the helium here, uh, about a tenth of the strength, which is what you'd expect. Uh, from the relative abundance. And so we can use these kind of lines to diagnose all sorts of things about ionized gas. So you can get an extra check on the temperature from the ratio of the strength of the line to the strength of the continuum, then that tells us about the temperature. Um, these very high level lines uh, up here, a long way from the uh, uh, nucleus, so they're very, the energy levels are very susceptible to collisions and which can change the uh, energy level slightly. And that leads to a broadening of the line. If you, if you change the energy level, then you're going to change the frequency of the line that's emitted. Uh, so you get something called pressure broadening. So yet another type of broadening. So these lines get, uh, can get very broad if the, if the density becomes high. And so if you look at a whole bunch of these, you can put, can, Good constraints on the density of the gas. If you look at the ratio of these strengths, you can find out the helium abundance. Okay. And if you look at the central velocity, you can work out, you know, the average velocity, relative velocity of the H2 region relative to us. And if we use that together with a rotation model of our galaxy, we can work out how far away uh, these kind of nebulae are. And if you study the detailed line profile, and especially at high spatial resolution, you can map out the velocity structure in your H2 region and work out that, you know, it's expanding or going off in one direction, all sorts of things. You can diagnose the kinematics. So that's one example of a spectral line. Another one that we obviously have met before uh, is the uh, atomic hydrogen 21 centimeter line. Again, here I'm just showing you an example of a line profile, this time from a spiral galaxy, where you can see one of these double peaked uh, line profiles. Okay, so again, this is at uh, near this frequency of 1420, which is the rest wavelength of um, the uh, 21 centimeter line. So uh, this double peakedness in a spiral galaxy, as illustrated on the next slide, is due to the rotation of the spiral galaxy. Um, so on the left here, um, it's not the same spiral galaxy, by the way, but uh, just to illustrate it. So in blue here, the blue colors on the left image are showing you the intensity of the 21 centimeter line. Uh, and in the background picture, you've got an optical picture of this spiral galaxy. So you can see the spiral arms coming out here and here. You can see that the gas actually extends way, way out past even where the stars are. So you've got the stars in here, and yet the um, uh, you know, the gas extends way out much further. So, and on the right, in the colours, we've got the same intensity map, but this time coloured with whether it's redshifted. So on this side, the hydrogen gas is moving away from us, and on this side of the galaxy, the 
uh, gas is moving toward, towards us, and you can see the axis of rotation uh, this way, as you would expect uh, from the tilt of the galaxy, which is obviously really circular. Okay, so um, yeah, that's the rotation, which gives rise to that double peak. When you add all the emission up together, which is what that previous one was, so that's integrated over the entire galaxy, you get a, um, a red peak and a blue peak. So that's the H1, and again, there'll be another whole lecture on uh, H1 in galaxies and all the different things you can do with it. And I'll just finish up here with some examples of molecular emission lines, okay, in the radio regime. Again, a lot of these are up in the millimetre, but some of them do come down into the centimetre regime, although this is more into the millimetres, at 100 gigahertz. This is the CN molecule, so you can see uh, an emission line here. And I just want to illustrate in the next three slides uh, this idea of uh, measuring magnetic field strengths with something called the Zeeman effect. Again, don't worry about it if you if you haven't come across it before, but it's, it's this idea that um, the electron uh, in an atom or a molecule is uh, spinning, okay? And if you put a strong magnetic field uh, on, uh, if you put your electron in a strong magnetic field, uh, it will start to process around the magnetic field line, okay? So the direction of the magnetic field, okay? And that um, gives rise to a splitting in the energy levels, okay? So you've got some, you've got another form of angular momentum here because of the precession, uh, and that's quantized as well. And so therefore, um, a line that used to be just one spectral line will start to split into multiple components, two or three, uh, components. Um, so we're not seeing like two separate components necessarily here. And often the easiest way to reveal it in radio astronomy is to actually look at the polarization and especially the circular polarization, because this idea of the uh, processing uh, electrons gives rise to uh, some circular polarization. Okay. And the different components uh, split in different directions. And so you get different directions of polarization uh, across your line here. And so the Stokes V, you can see it goes from positive to negative. Uh, and that is a telltale sign that you've got this Zeeman effect operating. And the bigger the split, the stronger the magnetic field. So we can measure magnetic field strength in the gas that way. So that's an emission line. As I mentioned at the beginning, you can also have absorption lines. Uh, so here uh, is the OH, uh, transitions in the OH uh, molecule or radical if more accurately. Uh, so here you've got a strong background continuum. So this time you've got a maybe a H2 region or something in the background, and then you've got a cloud of molecules in front of that. And as the photons go through the molecular cloud, uh, they get absorbed uh, at the wavelength of the transition. So you can see a strong absorption line here. So that's another way of uh, using spectral lines in a, is in absorption. And again, if you look at the polarization, the circular polarization with the Stokes V parameter, again, you see this telltale switch. And again, it's telling us the magnetic field strength in the molecular cloud. And as a final example, as a segue into the next lecture, um, we also have uh, these non-thermal lines um, due to the uh, maser process. So here's an example. Um, so you get very, very strong lines, yeah, hundreds, thousands of Janskis even. Uh, and in this example, uh, again, we've got this uh, Zeeman effect going on so we can measure the magnetic field that way as well. Much more about that, well, about masers uh, in the next lecture. So just to summarize here, um, spectral lines in the radio regime can be used to determine physical conditions, so densities and temperatures, uh, sometimes abundances, uh, and very importantly, the kinematics of gas. So if you want to find out how the gas out there in the interstellar medium or circumstellar objects or wherever is moving, then you need to find some spectral lines and observe them at high spectral resolution, and you can pick out, uh, try and understand the line profile to determine how the gas is moving. And in special cases, 
we get a handle on the magnetic field strength. Okay, so the Zeeman effect actually tells you the strength of the magnetic field. Um, in previous lectures, we've talked about polarization, uh, telling us about the geometry of the magnetic field. Uh, but here you can determine the strength as well. So that becomes a very powerful technique, um, especially as you know we will learn that uh, magnetic fields play important roles, uh, especially in the formation of uh, stars and in the acceleration and collimation of uh, radio jets. Okay, so that's uh, an introduction to spectral lines, and I'll leave it there.